Hi all. I have two interesting games to show you against the same opponent today. The opponent of the legends Bobby Fischer in the Varna Olympiad in 1962, so that's in Bulgaria. In the preliminary round, uh, the USA met the Romanian team, and they also met the Romanian team later. Fischer was playing Victor Charcaldel. And let's see how the first game went in the preliminary round. So we see e4 from Fischer. He was playing white. e5. Uh, Victor Charcaldel, just a little bit of background information, by the way, was awarded the IM title in 1957. So this is... Uh, a few years before this game, and the GM title in 1979. He was a Romanian champion in 1952, 59, 61, 69, 70, 71, 75 and 79. So an incredible Romanian chess player. He won first prizes at Re Reggio Emilia 1966 to 67 and 68 to 69, Dortmund 1974 and Bucharest 1975. His last tournament was Thessalonica 1983 where he finished third. Uh, but unfortunately, he passed away in Manresa, Spain, later that year. Okay, so we see knight f3 here, knight c6, classic royal of pairs. a6, bishop a4, and now black chooses the Steinitz uh, system, d6. So this is royal of pairs, the third Steinitz. We're going to evolve into that now. White now plays c3 so black's pretty solid but a little bit cramped with this system uh, we see bishop d7 d4 and black is often playing in this position the move g6 believe it or not if you in the bishop is actually playable here uh, just just to show you uh, if white tries to force issues with d takes uh, this this is perfectly fine for black. This has been played before. There's a few games here. Uh, okay, so anyway, so we see uh, a less usual move though. Instead of g6, we see knight g7. Black has a little bit of congestion issues, and with congestion, that might affect how resourceful a player can 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 be. How how they can demonstrate be resourceful from this kind of cramped position it's solid but it's cramped it's got a downside clearly so how can Fisher tap into that well Fisher this in on this turn at move seven instead of the routine casting move he actually switches his attention to the f7 square and it does introduce immediately a concern about knight g5 which actually prompts black into a weakening move here h6 just to prevent knight g5 uh if you know if g6 to routine g6 knight g5 is horrible as you can see here black is not in a great position to do something about that so we see this h6 uh and now again instead of the routine cast thing fisher chooses queen e2 black now plays knight g6 and we see quite an annoying battery now by Fisher. Queen c4, threatening mate in one. Prompting a response uh, to defend that somehow. But it's not completely ideal. Black defends with queen f6. The queen has limited scope here on f6. And actually now Fisher plays d5. So potentially going after the c7 pawn if the knight just retreats. Fisher could just take on c7. So black has to energetically kick the queen first. And yes, that does potentially create more impact for when white plays a4. The queen drops back, so a4 might be on the cards in the future. Knight a5, though, harassing the bishop. Bishop d1. Now, with the center closed, you'll see that the queen is actually quite restricted in her movements here. Bishop e7, even further more for the backward reverse gear here. And, okay, the f4 square might be useful for a knight later. 
Fischer takes that away at the cost of weakening his light squares. But note, with his bishop d1, he has supported the f3 square in advance. So bishop g4 can actually be met with h3, for example, here. The defensive battery has been set up. So this is afforded by that bishop d1, this g3 move. Black just castles. But now we see the move h4, and it looks as though maybe, you know, h5 is the idea, kick the knight back to a horrendous square. It looks as though that might be Fischer's intention. So maybe the opponent was just considering, okay, the knight goes back and I'll play the position after that. The opponent here played a move seemingly, well, oblivious, really, oblivious to actually another danger lurking in the position. The opponent played rook fc8. So Victor Schalkolter played rook fc8. Can you see a slight problem with this position for black? What can white play here, which is actually an embarrassingly crushing move? And yes, black, by playing this cramped opening, hasn't really demonstrated what a, a resourceful amazing player he actually is i think we can often be let down by openings and this this particular opening showing clearly congestion issues and in particular the queen being restricted and unfortunately this has accentuated this issue by fisher's move here if i give you five seconds to pause the video what would you play here with white so five seconds to pause the video check out the candidate moves and you might find one which is shockingly powerful here so five seconds starting from now. Okay. Bishop g5. Yep. The queen didn't have many squares. Black should have perhaps played on the last turn. Bishop d8 just to give the queen e7. And it's not so bad for black. Black could later play c6, open up the c file maybe justify the knight, etc. Black would have had an interesting game. But yeah, the game was unfortunately, after bishop g5, virtually decided because it's winning the queen. Black grabbed two pieces for the queen. Hg, hg, still winning the queen. There's no way of getting the queen out of here. One thing I guess that should be considered uh, is knight f4. Let's actually check this out is the position so dire black actually played queen takes g5 on knight f4 best it seems to take on f6 actually let black take white's queen f takes but here yeah black's just going to be material down now this knight's not getting back out it seems it could go there legally though <laughs> but king d2 is going to win that pesky knight yeah it's gonna be about plus three whatever happens in this position you might think hold on knight f4 best here uh, on g takes uh, that will actually sort out black's issues here on g takes h takes h takes then the queen can take there and on here queen f4 so on knight f4 let's let's have a note of knight f4 to get the queen out of this terrible predicament black's still in trouble with bishop takes f6 knight takes and uh, the the story again the knight is kind of stranded uh so black's just material down here gonna be material down okay so yeah it's winning material the opponent uh, played like this to get two pieces for the queen. And the game continues a little bit. Knight a3, a bit of concern. White wants to play b4, maybe without knight c4 happening. We'll be able to take it. c6, yes, it would have been nice to have played this c6 without losing the queen. Plays bishop e6 here. Queen h5 hitting the bishop on g5. Bishop g4 immediately threatening takes and takes here. 
So black takes, queen takes. Queen could come into d7 now. Knight takes c6, but instead actually rook d1 hitting d6. b4 is played. It's pretty grim. Knight c4. And black's maybe the spawn. He takes on c3. White could, in fact, just play knight b6 here. Uh, it's just a winning position. White just takes here and is in no rush. He's going to win more material now. Knight d4. This is kind of bypassed with knight b6, just forking the rocks. And black's had enough. And you might think, oh man, the opponent is a really bad player or something. He lost the Fisher so quickly, 26 moves. And in fact, he could have resigned on move 15. Actually, it shows how really destructive a bad opening position can be. Someone could be a fantastically resourceful player. This guy was the Romanian champion so many years from 1952, you know, onwards um, up until 1979. A really dangerous player when he's given a good position. And Fisher actually had the opportunity to play him later in this very same Olympiad. Now, yeah, let's keep these two games together in this video. And I'm going to load this second game. So Romania qualified for the finals. Now, Victor gets to play white here against Fisher in the same Olympiad. Okay, so we see e4, and Fisher plays his favorite Sicilian defense. Knight f3, d6. Let's turn this off for a moment. We see a quiet move d3, so King's engine attack style from Victor, playing white. Knight c6, g3, g6. And now after castles, we see e5. And yeah, playing white here. This, this looks like a pleasant enough position for the moment. And there has been hundreds of games from this position. It's, it's perfectly been playable, pop, quite popular, this position. And this next move is actually one of the main moves. C3, there's over 300 games in my book. White's queen is, is not going to be trapped, it seems, as easily as the previous game. There's no major congestion issues. In fact, far from congestion issues, white can actually with this structure, make use of it for a space gaining operation on the king side. We see Fisher playing knight ge7. And now actually white can try and actually stretch out his space and his peace scope and his mobility. He actually plays a very, very interesting move. Usually a3 is played here. But white adopts a very interesting plan. There are a few games in line book with this. Knight h4 with the idea of f4 and it seems you know if takes it takes there's a sli slight tactical risk with a loose piece but this is played directly without further delay here f4 so e takes g takes white's pieces uh, if allowed f5 are going to be given lots of scope this bishop's going to be opened up there's going to be threats of f6 so fisher stops that but he does create a light square target potentially. Uh, we see now knight d2, king h8. And the two knights support each other here, knight d f3. f takes and d takes now. And Fischl's idea would seem to be uh, to play an immediate d5 here, which kind of looks embarrassing a little bit to this pawn. It looks a little bit isolated on its own on f4. And are the knights awkward here? Is this an embarrassment for white? This pawn is blocking in the bishop. There's a nice blockade on the f5 square. Is this going to be a classic f5 blockade, positional murder or something? White plays e takes d5, queen takes, and takes off the queens. So immediately black is threatening knight takes f4. But white is not without resources here. Knight g5, protecting f4 and saying, go away, knight, on d5. And look at that bishop. It's a little bit better than the c8 bishop. And after knight b6, in fact, the other bishop doesn't look so bad now. It's hitting c5. All of a sudden, hang on a sec. The bishops 
are working well together and the knights seem to be working well together you know h6 is stopped knight takes g6 the knights are helping each other the bishops are helping each other there's good team spirit here for the Romanian pieces of white's position black plays knight a4 defending c5 rather awkwardly and as if knight takes b2 is a concern but white ignores the b2 pawn yeah he, he wants to take on c5 if knight takes b2 and get to the center foul and potentially you know there's an entry point on e7 to watch out for we see now bishop d7 and here we see bishop c1 white wants to evict this knight with rookie four actually that would be interesting and then maybe go back to e3 slight improvement of the position to hit c5 again we see bishop f6 now so there are cons concerns here about these knights bishop takes g5 on the cards in fact that's addressed here now the knights support each other like this not yet using the e4 square for a rook in fact the knight if it wants if it's kicked can go back to e4 here we see bishop f5 and now knight e5 it seems okay the bishop's blocked in but on the other hand the f4 pawn although it was previously looking a little bit isolated it is providing useful pegs on g5 and e5 for these knights that f4 pawn is actually a little bit of a hero here letting the knights have aggressive outpost squares in this position that truly is a double-edged aspect of the f4 pawn it looked a bit ugly earlier but it's the hero here for these knight outposts and with pressure now exerted on c6 black's knights by contrast they seem to be unsure what they're doing knight e7 and yeah our white is not tempted to give black counterplay maybe like this he just actually plays knight e4 he wants that dark square bishop if he can get it then he'll weaken this whole diagonal and he'll follow up with things like b3 and bishop b2 later so the bishop gets out of the way from being snapped off here with the move bishop h4 hitting the rook with tempo the rook moves and now we see rook ac8 but it goes into straight into a tempo gaining move knight d6 it's a difficult position for fisher if he didn't play rook ac8 this is still a, a very tricky uh position indeed here for black if you look you know the, the knights are really quite well placed centrally compared to black's knights uh, so black is under severe positional pressure this is not like a walkover game like the previous game remember uh, victor was really cramped in the previous game didn't have any resources look at his position here without the queens on the board but the knights seem far more dominant than black's knights why did fisher walk into a tempo grabbing move with rook c8 why would he want to do that it's a tricky position let's just check this out for a moment just to try to answer this question why would fisher walk into uh knight d6 it's not it's not actually one of the engine's <laughs> top choices um I think the concern is um, b3 basically this knight is putting pressure on c5 it's one arrow that I missed but it's a crucial arrow so b3 would force a concession from black if he doesn't want to lose c5 so yeah Fisher is in advance he doesn't want to give up the light square bishop there'll be even more trouble than the light squares okay so yeah it's a difficult position so rook ac8 going into this seemingly powerful tempo gainer rook c7 and Fisher wants some counterplay you know he wants white to take and then maybe maybe this for example could be good with the knight actually getting justified on a4 but no white sidesteps that politely and goes for a7 instead here he takes his first pawn officially a pawn up with tempo this is difficult now for Fisher this position rook a5 we see c4 which makes way for b3 and bishop b2 to get onto the diagonal 
knight b6. We see knight c3 here just protecting the a2 pawn. Knight a4, we see some dancing with the knights, and now the knight goes here instead. Bishop f6. And yeah, the b7 pawn looks to be hanging here, but white ignores that for the moment, he's in no rush. We see this move just improving the position slightly. Rook f e1. Wary of giving Fisher much counterplay. Knight a4. So the rooks are really kind of well placed here. Although white's grabbed that pawn and is suffering a little bit, the consequences, the knight is on a3. It looks a bit awkward. Goes back here to b5. And now to c3 here. Yeah, with the rook here, this facilitates taking here to hit this one. So this is now much more pleasant for the knights. Knight c6. And now white voluntarily gives up his light square bishop. So he's doubling black's pawns. c5 looks potentially a vulnerable pawn in the future. b3, safeguarding c4 now. And it really looks as though uh, the c6 pawn is, is dangerous, but for the moment, the knights are a bit loose. We see black playing knight d7 using that. Tactically, the position is very interesting here. White plays knight a4. The weaknesses here are evident in some variations, technical variations. White could have actually have considered here knight takes d7 because takes, takes, takes. White actually can safeguard both the rook and the pawn by playing a4 here because, and this is a very comfortable position with rook on the seventh. Bishop takes, we have bishop b2 check and it's lethal. This is lethal, this position. For example, like this is, is terrible for black, mated getting mated. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's, that can't be, um, that's, that can't be good for black, that scenario. But uh, yeah, White didn't play knight takes d7, and that really it shows how bad black position is. White plays knight a4. We have knight takes, f takes, bishop h4. Fisher tries to get some dangerous ideas around the squares of white's king here. Rook f1, pinning the bishop though for a moment. King g7, unpinning, at least the rook's protected. Rook d6, going for the queen side. Black uses the time of losing another pawn though to try and connect the rooks now to try and drum up some dangerous threats around white's king. White plays bishop e3, securing f2, not just looking at c5, bishop h3. And yeah, this is starting to look a little bit dangerous. Black threatening a mate in one here. White takes on f8 and now has to defend the mate in one. It brings back the rook, but still look at c5. It's a really weak pawn. Rook f5. Knight takes c5 is played here. Yes, there's no rook takes e5. Bishop d4 would pin the rook. Rook f3. And we see bishop d4. Rook f4. Yeah, it looks pretty dangerous actually though. The, the bishops and, and the rook are up to no good. We see this check here. Bishop e5. The bishop, by getting the e5 square, is able to defend against rook g4 check with bishop g3 at least, if needed. We see check here and rook g4 now. White first plays knight d7 check and in this position now plays bishop g3. Black is threatening mate in one. Up to no good here. The mate in one threats bishop g3. And this is difficult for black. Black actually played, Fisher actually played king takes e6. Yeah, uh, leaving the bishop seemingly hanging, but this, this position looks to be uh, at least, uh, this position here, I think there's bishop f3 check. Let's just check this out. Well, this bishop will not. I think this bishop f3 check myself just to win the rook, and that will actually be uh, okay for black at least. So, no, that it's best not to take this uh, bishop here, bishop g2 check, and, and bishop f3. Not not here because there's bishop g3. <laughs> That's the end of the game. 
So the uh, the bishop is ignored here. We just see rook d6 check, and now asking Fisher to exchange off the bishops here. So bishop takes g3 was played. Uh, if the bishop goes back, then this bishop's actually doing a fine job to support the knight as well, knight e5. And actually, the rook is really embarrassed in this scenario. Uh, if rook g5, we have bishop h4, for example. Uh, if rook e4, knight takes c6 check, it's it's uh, the e1 square is actually covered here, so there's no back row mate either. So white couldn't actually take that, it seems. So yeah, this this is not good. The bishop can't it can't retreat, it seems. Uh, bishop here, I mean, there's ideas for white. White could just play. Rook e2 looks, looks good, just the pin there. Uh, so, yeah, we see the simplification. Bishop takes, h takes, rook takes. And we have a bit of a race now, like in backgammon or something, with the pass pawns here versus the pass pawns here, which is going to get queening first. Knight e5 is played, hitting black's last remaining queenside pawn. It moves forward. King h2, rook e3, knight d3. Again, c5 is an issue. And the king can't defend that. Knight f4 check, surely. And then we're just going to take it the bishop. So bishop f5. Yeah, 3 to 0 is a nice pawn majority to have. This guy can play chess. Victor can play chess. He needed a good opening position, it seems. Fisher is on the ropes here. He tries to get his two pass pawns working. We're in a race situation. A4, H4, A5, G5. The race is on. With the white king here, can Fisher get any hope for useful checks? A6. We have in this position a delay with the pawn moves. We have king F6 getting out of the way. Yeah, the emergency brakes are going to be put on with rookie 8. A7, rookie 8 stopping the pawn. Rook a2, threatening a8, queening. Emergency break, blockade. But the, the reinforcements, the cavalry is, is coming up. g4, can Fisher's pawn save the day here? b5, check, king g2. The e4 square is covered by the knight. If h3 would just take here. King g5, the king's trying to help. b6, king g4, can the king help in time? White is not bothered by that. He plays b7. It looks as though white's first in the box here with a, with a, qu a queen coming. Check. The king goes to f1 in this position. With d3 covered by that knight. And now Fisher tries. What else can he do? This looks like a bleak position here indeed. Looks like a very bleak position because if ever a, a rook sack and g2, then king g1 surely, and a king g3, we've got b8 queening with check. These possibilities don't look good. Fisher tries g2 check here. But white here on move 69 plays a move and Fisher resigns. Can you guess what move white plays? If I give you five seconds to pause the video. Okay, just wipes out Fisher's pawns. Rook takes g2 check. We have two connected pass pawns here on the brink of queening. Fisher resigns here. It's hopeless. Hg king takes. This is hopeless for black. We're going to have a queen, and there's only a spike check in this final position. Let's just check this out. We queen here. A spike check, and then what? Nothing. And you might think, was the rook sack even necessary? Was white's position strong enough? Well, actually, you're right. The, the position is really just winning here. King g1. There's, there's no time for king g3. We can win with b8, queen, check in this position. The position was winning. Didn't even need rook takes g2. 
the strength of the position is, is such. King g1 is winning, King f2 is winning. The pawns are just overwhelming here. If black tries this, we just, what is, what is black doing here? Nothing, there's nothing. What a great game. I think, you know, an interesting fairness to show both games in the same video. And there's something about this, you know, the brutality of chess, the openings restrict players' talent and resourcefulness. If someone has a very passive, cramped position, of course they, they're sometimes going to be humiliated from such a position. That Steinitz deferred of the first game, Victor wasn't able to show his true power as a chess player. Give him a good opening. Yeah, he's gaining space on the king side. His knights and bishops are working well together. Queenless position, intense queenside pressure. Winning the a7 pawn, getting his knights centralized again after that. You know, sometimes you win material and you're off balance. He gets the balance back in his position, centralizing the knights. And then, you know, he doubles black's pawns. And, and later, you know, he's disintegrating slowly black's queenside until he has a three to zero pawn majority. And in the race scenario, Fisher has to put the emergency brakes and get his rook into a terribly passive position but this rook is dual purpose all the time attacking and defending black didn't stand a chance in the race scenario a fantastic game uh from victor Chukolta. uh so this is i think regarded as his most notable game multiple times romanian champion so yeah he stood up to fisher in the 1962 olympiad in that second encounter in particular Okay, I hope you got something from it. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.